Tomorrow, we will remember a man that walked in our midst, preached in churches, challenged the status quo of his day, Martin Luther King, Jr. A number of us remember those days, the 60s, and the time that Dr. King was assassinated in 1968. A terrible year. Bobby Kennedy was also assassinated around that same time period of 1968 as well. It was a time of turmoil. And I think about that periodically in relationship to today. 2018-2019 now we live in. And we are, as a people, wondering what is going on. Can we survive these days? Can we live through these days of turmoil, of hatred, of anger, of confrontations? I remember the time where it seemed almost as bad, if not worse, than it is today. I remember one of my cousins was a law enforcement officer at Iowa State University during some of the race riots that occurred. And I remember Jack, and Jack was small of stature, as you would say, nothing like me. Jack, if he could make it to five foot five, he would have been a good day for him. But he was stout and strong. And I recall a story from Jack. I didn't see it, but my father did. There was a young man protesting at Iowa State, and Jack went up behind him because he wouldn't move from a chair that he'd sat down in the middle part of the campus. And Jack came up to him from behind and picked up the chair with him in it to move him from the location he was at. Not escalating the violence, but trying to find a, an answer and trying to calm the situation. Dr. King was such a person who sought to challenge us about how we lived together, how we interacted together. Some of his more famous quotations, quotes, and comments that he would make, and there are many, but here are some. One of the sure signs of maturity is the ability to rise to the point of self-criticism. The ability to rise to the point of self-criticism, not towards others, but towards self. If you want to say that I was a drum major, say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. Say that I was a drum major for righteousness. And to ignore evil is to become an accomplice to it. Most people, he said, and Christians in particular, or thermometers that record or register the temperature of the majority of the opinions, not thermostats that transform or regulate the temperature of society. A very big difference, isn't it? Are we thermometers or thermostats? Do we seek to influence our society and our communities in which we live, or we just record how high and low things are. The law may not be able to make a man love me, but it can keep him from lynching me. And last but certainly not least, power without love is reckless, abusive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. So I think it is interesting that today we reflect upon and we think about having just heard an 
the Gospel according to St. John, the first miracle of Jesus, a wedding. Jars of water change <coughs> into the celebratory wine. Transformed by God to celebrate community. We need to, to try to go back in time just a tad bit. A wedding in the time of Jesus, unlike most of our weddings today, would have taken place over days, not hours, but many days. Today's world, my daughters, the three of them, I think one, if not two, of one of them for sure have gone to what is called, and maybe you are familiar with this, destination weddings. The one had to save up for months because one of their friends asked him to go to some place down south where nice and warm and go wedding on the beach. Destination wedding. If my father was alive, he'd be shaking his head like I shake my head sometimes, I'm sure. They got married in the parsonage by the pastor. In 1941, paid the pastor $20, which in today's funds, I don't know how much it would be, a pretty good chunk of money. I'm a figure inflation. But today we've got destination weddings. And people put so much energy into it. As we announced just a, a few weeks ago, our second daughter has announced that they're engaged and they're going to be getting married in 2020 in the small town of Manning over in Western Iowa. Already setting up plans for who's going to cater the meal, where's the reception going to be, where's the rehearsal dinner going to be, how many groomsmen, bridesmaids, how much money are they going to spend on flowers, etc., etc. It has become and it is a production as we know, spending a few hundred or tens of thousands of dollars on weddings. Yeah, but a wedding, whether or not it is at a parsonage, or at a church, on the beach, or in the mountains where one of my nieces got married, it has become a statement, if you will, sometimes. Even in Japan, I've read that 60% of the weddings are done in the manner of a Christian wedding, even though only 2% of the population are Christians. They like the fashion statement, the imagery of the wedding. And that's where we get ourselves in lots and lots of trouble. This image of the ceremony as a wedding, the ceremony as the marriage, When I prepare to do a wedding, to celebrate and to officiate, I always have a meeting, at least two or three meetings with a couple. And there's a couple of questions I always ask them, and more, but at least two that I want to lift up. One is, how are you going to conduct your finances? Practical questions, but are you going to share a checking account? Are you going to have separate checking accounts? Honestly, I don't care how you all do it. But I want to know, have you talked about it? And if you haven't, then you better sit down across the table and decide how you're going to do this. Another one is, how many children are you going to want? If she says she wants six and he goes, I want one, you may want to have a conversation before you go out down that aisle. And then one of my favorite questions, and sometimes I just get this odd look from them, I ask them, how do you, how do you sort through a disagreement? I might want to say argue, but sometimes people get kind of push back at that argument. But how do you, when you don't agree on something, how do you decide to move beyond that? Does your family yell and scream and holler at each other? 
Or do you quietly try to sort through whatever's going on? You know, the old stereotype of the old Greek or the Italian families where dishes are thrown and yelling and screaming, and that's the true expression of love. Or is it the quiet, reflective, well, let's pause and think about this. Now, if you've got one on this side and one on that side, and that's the way they sort things out, they might have a problem. And we, too, might have problems by looking at things like this in that way. Human relationship. We don't all see things the same way. We all don't live in an area where there's white stuff on the ground where some would be running out there looking at what is this stuff. We just kind of look at it and go, huh. Eh. In our story today, Jesus takes six jars, as we were told, stone jars. Stone jars that are used for the purification of the community. We need to understand in our Protestant Christian point of view just a tad bit of the Jewish roots of this story. And I only know a little bit. But I do know this, that the purification jars were around because typically the rite of purification, everything had to be cleansed. Hands and utensils, so on and so forth. And that's why these six very, very large jars were around the water. Now, interesting enough for me, anyway, when I read this story and I go, all right, these are the six very large jars of purification for the cleansing of the hands and the utensils and stuff. And Jesus takes these same jars and transform them into the celebration of new wine, a new life, a new way of, of looking at things. At least I think that's what I have gotten out of this story, at least in this, this, this year of 2019. He's changing how we look at things. You know, last week I mentioned John the Baptist, and we remember John the Baptist. He's going around with a camel coat and is eating locusts and honey, a little bit rough around the edges, as we might say, and he's going, who told you to come, you brood of vipers? Not exactly the most welcome of statements if you were a pastor to welcome your congregation. Welcome to the Soul of United Methodist Church, you brood of vipers. May not be as many people here next week if I did that continually. But that was John's approach. But it wasn't Jesus' approach. John came harshly to the people. In the movie called The Temptation of Christ, or rather The Last Temptation of Christ, there's a scene, if you ever saw the movie, you might remember that John and Jesus, John the Baptist, that is, and Jesus, are, are, are a great big argument about their role within the world. John the Baptist, his face is hard, his, his eyes are ablaze and angry, he's just tense. Jesus asks, isn't love enough? Isn't love enough? And John, again in his anger and his frustration, says, no, the tree is rotten. God has called me and gave me the axe, which I have placed at the root of the tree. I have done my duty. Now do yours. Take the axe and strike. That's how John saw it. That's sometimes how we see it. It's sometimes how our sisters and brothers see it. It's how we see often our culture right now. 
things are rotten. Let's take an axe to it. Let's beat it to death. And beat it again when it doesn't respond. This is the way we deal with conflict. John the Baptist said, you brood of vipers. Our culture says, you brood of vipers, relent and give in to my way of seeing things, my way of doing things. I've got the axe ready. I'm going to cut you down. But Jesus, Jesus comes along with a different viewpoint, very different than John the Baptist. I suspect it's why John the Baptist said, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to even untie the thongs of his sandals. He's coming. And our last temptation of Christ in response to John's anger and frustration at what he sees, Jesus quietly replies, if I were fire, I would burn. And if I were a woodcutter, I would strike. But I, but I am heart. John was a person of judgment. Jesus was most assuredly a person of mercy and of grace. Ever vigilant with his call, but also ever vigilant in his grace and peace in dealing with us and humanity in general. The wedding. We are the bride is God's church. And God is the groom in the stories of the Old and New Testament. This is the way it is outlined for us. We are the bride. He is the groom. Together, we share something unique. A hope for a world that has lost its hope. We are called to be rich with joy, love, hope, and peace. And if those words sound familiar, perhaps you will remember the Advent wreath that used to sit here just a few short weeks ago, and the four candles in preparation for the celebration of his birth. Joy. Love, hope, and peace. A number of years ago, I read an article by, about a, a man by the name of Patrick Cooney titled, Why I Wear Two Wedding Bands. He says that he's worn two wedding bands for more than two dozen years. And when he's asked about them, he always responds that I have two wives. He's kidding, of course. But it was one day he said that a stranger would not let him off with this glib little answer about why he wears two bands. And so he revealed the, the whole story is. As Paul Harvey used to say many years ago to those, I'm aging myself, now the rest of the story. He explained that his father died in 1999. And as they were saying their final farewells at his funeral, his mother, Patrick said, who had been married to his father for 50 plus years, removed his father's wedding band and handed it to him, handed it to Patrick. Surprised, he said he placed the gold band on his left finger next to his own wedding band. And he said, there it has remained. He 
told the stranger that he wears his father's wedding band to honor his father and his parents' marriage. He also wears it to remind himself to be the son, the brother, the husband, and the dad that his father wanted him to be. He's now 60 years old, has been married for more than 30 years. The stranger walked away, he said, and then turned back momentarily and said, Sir, you know, I have my father's wedding band in the sock drawer at home. <coughs> Beginning today, I'm going to start wearing it. The wedding. Faithfulness to the relationship, to people, to God, and to God's world. Jesus came and he crashed 